The Bible says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. We're looking at some problem verses, and they're not a problem to us, but they are a problem to either those who've not studied their Bible very well or those who simply try to deny some clear Bible truth. So we're going to deal with a couple of different passages tonight. The first one will be in 2 Peter chapter 2. Notice verses 20 through 22. For after, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them, but it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I plead tonight for the filling of the Spirit of God. Give us what we need, the truth of your word. May hearts be open to it, and Father, we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Of course, it's important that since some obviously may have missed what we covered on once saved, always saved, I need to review it very, very briefly without turning to all the verses that we turned to when we first covered it. Why do we believe in the eternal security of the believer? Number one, Jesus taught it. I mean, you just go to John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If words have meaning, and they do, and they mean exactly what they say, how can you have everlasting life and end up in hell? Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 37, All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. In John chapter 5 and verse 24, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's a pretty good promise. Shall not come into condemnation. In John chapter 10, beginning of verse 27, he says, uh, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. No man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now that's pretty good, that's pretty good security right there. You're in His hand. Nobody can pluck you out. You're in God's hand. Nobody can pluck you out. He'll not cast you out. I'd say that is being eternally secure. Now we covered other verses as well, but we're just reviewing tonight. Not only did Jesus teach it, but Paul taught it. Now, we know everything that Paul wrote was actually given to him by the Holy Ghost of God. Isn't that right? Now, Paul was the man who had the pen in his hand. Sometimes he was just talking. Another man had the pen in his hand. Sometimes he simply dictated it. But the Holy Ghost was dictating it to him. And I don't care. You can call that dictational inspiration if you want. We believe in every word of the Bible coming from God. So we just believe the book. But he taught it in Romans chapter 8. You remember verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this one thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Twice in the book of Ephesians he says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. We're not sealed to the next time you sin. We are sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Ghost of God. That's why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If you can lose your salvation, then you are not confident that you're going to be present with the Lord when you die. It supposes eternal security. Not only did Jesus teach it, Paul taught it, but the nature of salvation demands it. Wow. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, most anybody who tell you, tell you that you can lose your salvation, they give you this kind of a scenario. We well, are saying, Brother Allison, that this man can get saved, go out and rob a bank, get killed while he's robbing the bank, and die and go to heaven. The whole problem with that is the idea that, well, he doesn't deserve to go to heaven. He doesn't deserve to go to heaven if he doesn't rob a bank. 
you need to understand something. Salvation is by grace. It is undeserved divine favor. It is not of works. You do not get saved by your works. You do not stay saved by your works. Romans chapter 11 and verse 6, if it be of grace, and is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, and is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. It's either all of grace or it's not of grace at all, one or the other. And as he says, not of works as any man should boast. And we gave other verses dealing with that. The work of Christ secures the eternal security of the believer. As he tells us, this man offered one sacrifice for sin forever. And he says he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. First John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, now how many of my sins were future when he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary? And when he shed his blood, it paid for all of them. So to think that somehow some future sin I'm going to commit is going to send me to hell when Romans chapter 8 made it plain, nothing to come can send me to hell. Uh, and that some sin I might commit in the future was not covered by the blood of Christ. They were all future when he went to the cross of Calvary. Not only that, the work of salvation assures it. Jesus taught it. Paul taught it. The nature of salvation demands it. The work of Christ secures it. And the work of salvation assures it. Number one, when you get saved, you are made a child of God. He adopts you into his family. There is a new birth. Yes, that's the work of regeneration of the Holy Spirit. But you are also adopted into the family of God. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Not only that, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places if you've been saved. You're already seated there, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3. Not only that, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you are made members of the body of Jesus Christ, which is eternal. And not only that, you are predestined to be like him by his power. Not predestined to be saved, but all the saved are predestined to be conformed to the image of his dear son. Romans chapter 8, verses 28, 29 and 30. So now we come to this passage that we read tonight. This is one of those passages that people would like to use to prove that once saved, always saved is not true. First of all, let me remind you of some rules of biblical interpretation. Number one, the Bible never contradicts itself. Now we just, we've gone through an awful lot of verses. We didn't cover them all tonight, of course. Awful lot of verses very plainly tell us that once you're saved, you are saved for eternity. The Bible never contradicts itself. Number two, never undo clear verses with the unclear. Never take a very clear verse of scripture and somehow cloud it and make it say, make it mean something else on the basis of a verse that you can't get hardly any two people to agree on to begin with. Number three, Always interpret the unclear in light of the clear. That's very important. And all scripture's first interpretation is always according to context. Always look at the context. If you're going to remove scripture from its context, then you can get the scripture teaching that there is no God. For the Bible says very plainly in the Psalms, there is no God. That's an exact quote. But the whole verse says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So don't let people go and take those verses out of context to say something that they're not saying. So the first thing then that we have to look at is the context of the passage. Who is he talking about? Well, the passage does not begin in verse 20. You go all the way back to verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. In verse 1, he calls these people, notice, false prophets, and he calls them false teachers. Look down at verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, it's an interesting term, unjust, because just a few verses before that in verse 7, he talks about Lot, who definitely did not have a stellar Christian life. And it says here, who de and delivered just Lot. 
Lot was just. Why? He was born again. Didn't live like a just man. Didn't act like a just man. His thinking had been warped because of what he had exposed himself to. But he was just. The people he's talking about in this passage are unjust. These are people that have not been born again. Not only that, it says about him in verse 12. And But these as natural brute beast. That's what he calls them. Natural beast. Brute beast. In verse 13, it says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. So he calls them spots and blemishes. And then in verse 17, These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved Forever, These people are not some, don't have something to lose it. You notice where they're reserved for. It's for darkness forever. They are wells without water. They are clouds blown about by the wind. Now that's who he's talking about when you get to verses 20 and 20 through 22. He's already set the basis. But also notice the things that these people do. In verse 1, we read it. They bring in damnable heresies. They deny the Lord that bought them. According to verse 2, they get many followers, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You go down through history, and you'll find there have been many false teachers who've gotten themselves great crowds. But great crowds does not determine truth. People are easily led astray. Not only that, we see in in verse 10, they walk after the flesh. For he says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. So they despise government, they speak evil of dignities. By the way, angels won't do that before God. They don't do it. Now, also, verse 12, they speak evil of things they don't understand. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Now, it's obvious from what we've read so far, we're not talking about people who are saved. And you remember this, you cannot lose that which you do not have. If you are not saved, you sure can't lose salvation. You don't have salvation. According to verse 18, they speak great swelling words. Notice it says, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, that is emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them, who live in error. And then in verse 19, notice, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of, uh, for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. Now God gives some warnings concerning this crowd. He says, for instance, in verse four, he warns them that he judged fallen angels. And then in verse five, he judged the lost world. Man, he destroyed an entire world in Noah's day. Think about that. He destroyed. You know, God's judgment is often very severe. I tell you, you you talk to most people in the quote-unquote professing church today and they get this idea that God's not harsh about anything. Listen, God's not playing. You look down through history in His Word, He hasn't been playing with mankind. And somehow for mankind to get this idea that God doesn't really mean any of that harshness, yeah, that's in the past, but He's changed, He's mellowed. He has not changed. For I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. He tells us in verse 6 that he, that he uh, judged Sodom and Gomorrah. Notice it says, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. That's men, women, children, everything else that was there. God killed them. We're talking about God killed them. He's warning about the judgment that these people are facing. They may be religious, but judgment is coming. He tells us in verses 7 through 9 that he delivered the saved, even though his life was dirty, that was Lot, and reserved judgment for the lost. 
And then in verse 13, he tells us, notice, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Sponsor they and blameless, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. And then in verse 17, he says in this verse, these are wells without water, clouds that are carried about without tempest. Now look at this, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. I have a quote here from Harry Ironside. Obviously, he wrote this probably about 80 years ago. But the Spirit of God in verses 20 and 21 is not contemplating reality, but simply profession. In other words, these people profess salvation. You remember the story, of course, that Jesus told about the farmer who had his servant sow the good seed, and then at night the enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat. I got news for you. At Madison Baptist Church, I don't have any doubt there's tares among the wheat. You're not going to have a place that's a soul-winning place that's not going to have some tares in it. And if you're looking for a church that doesn't have any, well, you'll never stop any place. You need to get some things settled because the enemy is always going to be around to put some tares in among the wheat. And it shouldn't, shouldn't shock us when it happens. Jesus warned us it would happen. That's just the way it is. But anyway, let me get back here to Harry Ironside. He speaks of those who have escaped pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is, having accepted the doctrines of Christianity, they have professedly given up the world. It's sin, it's folly, but there's never been a new nature imparted. They've not been born of God. Consequently, there is always a desire to gratify the lust of the flesh. And when they come in contact with these false teachings, they are easily entangled therewith and overcome. And so the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. That's like the groups of people that are falling into the seeker-friendly and the emerging group crowd today. You know, they end up start out going to some Bible-believing churches. They like some of the different message. But the flesh, as more was offered in churches, now, man, you can be a church person and still listen to your rock music. You can still participate in all kinds of things that are wicked and it leaves you open to doctrine. After all, you don't want to be one of the oversaved. You don't want to be considered one of the oversaved. Oversaved, those are people who believe God actually wrote what he meant and meant what he wrote. Those are people that are easily led astray. That's what he's talking about in this passage. And many of them become teachers. One of the things you'll learn about the emerging church, a number of their leaders came out of conservative Bible-believing churches. That's not what they're teaching today. And that's not what they want you to believe today. He says here, anyone who, became, who becomes acquainted with the teachings of Christianity knows the way of righteousness. Men may give adherence to that way for the time being, who do not actually know Christ for themselves. But then Peter makes it plain in verse 22 that these are not people who were saved. For if, if all the rest of it didn't get you, verse 22 ought to take care of it. He says, for it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. What's the problem? They never became sheep. Remember, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. He tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, in, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. You're made a new creature. Why, man? I don't go back to the hog pen anymore and wallow in the mud. And I'm not like a dog that goes back and eats his vomit. I'm now a sheep and I belong to God. What is sheep? Hallelujah. These were people who never got born again. Oh, they're religious. They had all the outward trappings and even their speech seemed to show it. But you look at this long description. It's obvious these are not people. These are not people who were born again. Many of your cult leaders get the exact description of these folks. Take Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons. He belonged to just about every different denomination that there was. And for a while, and each of them seemed to be a good member. Take Thomas and Alexander Campbell, the, found, uh, the uh, founders of, uh, well, what is today the Church of Christ or the Campbellites. They were out of the Red River Baptist Association when they started pressing their teaching for baptismal regeneration. You see, there the description is given right here. 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 
That's reality. It's not a problem versus, verse for us because these verses here are not talking about saved people to begin with. Well, let's go to another one that causes some people trouble. Go over to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Notice verses 4 through 6 specifically. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now again, first thing we have to do is go to context. Because you always interpret scripture within the context. Hebrews is a book that is written to Hebrew Christians. People who were born again, they had been Jews, and they were facing great persecution because they had become believers in Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. As a result, some of them, because of the persecution they were under, were tempted to turn back to the trappings of Judaism. And the writer is basically writing to say that what they have in Christ is far better. And you remember in chapter 1, he lets them know that uh, he is better than the prophets. In chapter 2, we see he's better than the angels. We see he's also better than Moses. By the time you get to chapter 5, he's better than Aaron's priesthood. And he begins a discussion in chapter 5 that the priesthood of Christ is after the order of Melchizedek. He begins to explain that in chapter 5, and then he interrupts that teaching on the priesthood to give a rebuke. If you look at verse 11, well, let me go to verse 10, because that's at the end of this part of the discussion on being the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He says, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And it's almost like as he writes, he's thinking, you know, I just said something. These people are not at the place where they can get it. For he says to him here, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe." But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know, I don't have to sit down and parse a rock song to know it's evil. I don't have to look at who the person is that sang it. I don't have to look at the musical score. I don't have to see how they're dressed. Why? My senses have been exercised, man. As soon as I hear it, I know it's evil. You understand that? There are some Christians have never come to the place to get deep in God's word. They don't want to list anything as being evil. They have a good God, good devil. It makes no difference. As a result, they become dull of hearing. They want to wear what they want to wear, go where they want to go, do what they want to do, talk like they want to talk. They're dull of hearing. They can't go on to the deeper things in the Word of God. They've not even learned to discern the difference between good and evil. I'm absolutely silly. There's some Christians today talking about whether or not drinking's all right. Man, it's wicked. It's a sin. There's so many curses on it in the Word of God. That ought to take care of it. But some people, they've just, they've not had their senses exercised to discern the difference between good and evil in a number of areas. By the way, your parents didn't start teaching you the times tables or geometry or algebra when you were six months old. You know what they taught you? No. First thing they taught you was some things not to do. I mean, they weren't even expecting you to talk at six months. They'd been shocked if you did. And had been thrilled and told everybody and tried to get you to repeat it. Isn't that right? But the truth is, if you didn't learn the difference between some parts of good and evil before you could even learn all the other stuff, you wouldn't have been allowed to make it here. You'd have been putting your finger in light sockets. You'd have been all kinds of stuff that had been dangerous. You had to learn something about some right and wrong. By the way, that's always been part of life. It's one of the reasons the book of Proverbs is written. So you'd be able to discern the difference between the strange man, the evil man, the strange woman, and so on. I'm not even preaching on that tonight, but that was pretty good, though, wasn't it? I liked it. It was free. All right? 
Now, so then he says in verse 6, he says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation, here's the foundation, of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Do you realize what I just described is what most of the preaching is that goes on in our churches? And that's milk. That's just milk. But And these people weren't ready for anything other than milk. But you've got to come to a place where you can sit and listen to a message on justification and get something out of it. And regeneration. You've got to be able to listen to some messages on eschatology and learn something about last things. I could use all those other long words too. I memorized some of them. Don't know what they mean, but they're cool. Then he says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Now, he says what they need to do is go beyond the milk of the word, list the seven things of the milk, doctrine of Christ, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. We can move on if God permit. That's when you get to verses 4 through 9. Now, this is a passage that a lot of people have had differing opinions on for a long long time. I'm going to give you two different possible explanations. You can read it. I want you to think about it. One explanation. Number one, keeping in mind the context. He's not talking about losing salvation. By the way, if he is talking about losing salvation, then once you lose it, you can't ever get it back. You know, most of the people that, matter of fact, almost all the people believe a person can lose their salvation thinks, but you can repent now and get it back again. If that verse is teaching you to lose your salvation, you, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Once you place that definition on this verse, you've just made it plain. Once you've lost it, you're done. That's it. Remember, we are moving on if God permits. He's going on because those who would have fallen back into those teachings... Cannot be saved. As a matter of fact, that's pretty much the teaching that Schofield gave in the Schofield Bible. He does not uh, doubt the salvation of those that he's writing to. As a matter of fact, if you look back in chapter 3 and verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Does he doubt their salvation? Not at all. You go over to verses 9 and 10, by the way, at the end of this passage. He says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have shown toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. In other words, this is very similar to Second Peter chapter 2, as we covered that. Except... These had not gone as far. They had come to the place where the Holy Ghost of God had convicted them. They recognized it's true. I'm lost. Christ is my only hope. They've come to that place where they know they need to make the decision. God has convicted them clearly and they make that final decision. No, I reject it. J. Harold Smith, in his message, God's Three Deadlines, would have called that one of the deadlines. Now, I said two explanations. That is a popular one. If you have a Schofield Bible, he'll go into more detail. You can cover that. Explanation number two. A study of words of the passage and a look at the whole passage. He's not talking about salvation at all, but repentance. Talking about renewing them again to repentance. What's he saying? All right, keep your hand here a moment. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. He says, for godly sorrow... Uh, I need to read verse 9, give you an idea of what's going on in this passage. Do you remember, remember in 1 Corinthians, he had rebuked the Corinthians throughout the book. He even told them they needed to discipline one of their members. He says in the second book to the Corinthians, he says, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly sort, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, he had rebuked this church in the first letter. They repented. And he's letting them know that godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. For instance... 
According to chapter 2, the man who was taken adultery with his father's wife had gotten right. The church was commanded to forgive him. What did he do? Here's a saved man who repented. Here's a church that saved people who repented. What salvation is he talking about? The salvation from judgment. In Philippians chapter 1, when the apostle Paul was in prison, he mentions to the Philippians that their prayers would bring about his salvation. He's not talking about the salvation of his soul. He's talking about the salvation from jail. This is dealing with the salvation from the judgment of God upon his people. Does God judge his people? Just read the book of Revelation. Of course he does. He warns the church at Ephesus when he says, I have someone against you and that you've left your first love. He says, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do thy first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick from its place. So that church getting right would save them from the judgment of losing their church for the candlestick is the church according to chapter 1 and verse 20 of the book of Revelation. So we come back to this passage. And remembering that, by the way, Ephesus was not the only church that he told to repent. God does tell Christians to repent. And here's the idea. The word translated fall away, by the way, that's translated fall away, is not the word apostasia. He's not talking about becoming apostate in this particular place. It has the idea to fall by the side, that is to wonder. The idea is having now fallen by the side. What was Paul's concern in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians? Why did he continue to beat his body to bring it under subjection? Lest at any times he be made a castaway. He didn't want to be set on the sidelines. He wanted to continually serve God. And that's the idea. You get into sin, brother, you'll lose your power. You might even lose, you'll lose your position. You can lose your ministries. And you who one time served God can end up sitting on the sidelines from now on if you're not careful. It could happen to me. It could happen to you. Galatians 6, 1, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one, the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. All right, so saying here that the idea, well, well, the idea is this, while they're crucifying to themselves the Son of God afresh, here's what it gets down to. Explanation number two says these are not lost people who never got saved, like Second Peter chapter 2. Explanation number two says these are saved people, much like Lot, who got into sin in their life, and the idea is until they decide to stop their sinning, it's impossible for them to repent. They have to come to the place where they're like the prodigal son when he's in the hog pen. I mean, after all, he didn't, he didn't write a letter to dad, say, dad, I'm enjoying myself in the hog pen, send money. No, he came to a place of repentance where he said that, you know, my father's, that my servants have better than, than what I have here. The servants in my father's house. I'm not even worthy to be called his son any longer. And he went there humbly in a spirit of repentance and was received. Well, until he made that decision, then he's just staying in the hog pen. He'd already spent his inheritance, by the way. Dad wasn't going to, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, subsidize his continually living in the hog pen. I've seen it over and over again. Until, matter of fact, you take a person gets into any sin until they come to the place where they're willing to say, hey, I'm wrong. I'm in sin. You can't get them back right with God. It's not possible till they come to that particular place. Now, if you notice verses 7 and 8, he says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiving uh, receiveth blessing from God, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh cursing, whose end is to be burned. He's not talking about the land here. He's talking about the fruit of the land. Bad fruit will be burned. Well, that harmonizes with First Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. He says, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. 
For the fire trieth every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive reward. If any man's work be burned, he shall suffer loss, though he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Yeah, that fits. That goes right along with the scripture. The person falling back will be saved, yet so is by fire, but will only have ashes to present at Jesus' feet. And so he says in verse 9, But beloved, we're persuaded better things of you. He's not looking at these people dying and going to hell. So explanation number two says, no, this is not like 2 Peter chapter 2. These are people that were saved. He's saying, we expect but to accompany your salvation. Now, it's interesting in Brother Cloud's book on things hard to be understood. He has a brief article about the book of Hebrews teaching eternal security. I'm using that because not only does the word of God not contradict itself, God's not going to contradict himself in the same book. And notice, Brother Cloud gives, I believe, uh, let's see, gives six reasons, six ways that the book of Hebrews teaches eternal security. Number one, Christ purging promises security in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 30. Number two, Christ rest promises security in Hebrews 4 and verse 10. Number three, Christ hope promises security in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. Number four, Christ high priesthood promises security in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. Number five, Christ's blood promises security in Hebrews 9, 12 and verse 26. And in those things, four things under this about Christ's blood, we have eternal redemption through his blood in Hebrews 9, 21. Sin is put away through his blood in Hebrews 9, 26. We are sanctified once for all through his blood in Hebrews 10 and verse 10, and we're perfected forever through his blood in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. Then the sixth one was this, Christ's covenant promises security in Hebrews 8, 12 and 10, 16 through 19. It is obvious even from the book of Hebrews, yet alone from all the other verses that we've covered on eternal security as we've, as we've covered it, there's no way this, is past, this passage could be teaching that you can lose your salvation. So he's either dealing with people who came to that place, like the people in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, who came to the place where they recognized it was truth, but they make the final decision not to take it. They tasted the good word of God. They tasted. They didn't take it in. It's not theirs. And then they said no, and it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Or it's the other, where these are people who've gotten into sin... And it's impossible to renew them to repentance until they decide to stop their sin. One of those two. Now, I'd say in this crowd, we probably got probably 50-50. As long as you realize it does not teach, you can lose your salvation. And if you're one of those, you say, well, no, I believe teaching you can lose your salvation. Then you've got to believe you can't get it back once you lose it. If not, you're just one of those people who play with everything in the Word of God. Let's bow our heads forward a prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the wonderful salvation we have in Christ. As Paul said in the word of God, he said, testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And those who come to the Lord Jesus Christ receive that free gift of eternal life, whereby we shall never perish, so that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, if there's one here tonight that's never taken Christ as their Savior and received that wonderful salvation of eternal life that only Christ can give, I pray you'd move upon their heart to come to the Savior tonight. I pray, Heavenly Father, for believers tonight. May they rejoice. We don't need to sit around wandering, scared to death whether or not we're going to heaven, for you've not given the spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. The sound mind says all of his promises concerning salvation are true. Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in every heart. In Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet.